He had come to prison at the tender age of 18. Now, four years later, he was leaving with an education a man could get nowhere else. He had learned the hard way that if you were going to live a life of crime, go for the big buck. Now, he was ready. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Ralph Reads, brought to you by T-U-R-N, the United Ronin Networks. My name is Ralph Anthony Garcia, also known as R4. Please like, share, comment, and subscribe to the United Ronin Networks. We are Ronin. On this edition of Ralph Reads, I revisit the mind that is the legendary Donald Goins as I begin another miniseries featuring the novella Black Gangster, written in 1972 and published by Holloway House, a Kensington Publishing Corporation. Let's fasten our seatbelts again, dear folks, and let the reading commence. Chapter 1 The sun was shining through the bars on the window as Prince, tall, slim, and black, got up from his bed and paced back and forth in his cell. He stopped in front of the small calendar he kept on the wall and smiled. It had been a long time, but he had managed to keep his sanity. Suddenly, the sound he had been waiting for reached him, loud and clear. Break one! The yell was sharp, and before it had diminished, the sound of over a hundred steel doors opening together drowned it out. Break two! came the yell again, followed by another hundred iron doors opening at the same time. Voices were raised in harsh humor as over 400 men joked and argued back and forth. Break three! The break man screamed as he reached the third gallery. Prince glanced into the small mirror hanging over his face bowl, reached up and patted down his large afro hairstyle, and then rushed to the front of his cell and snatched open the steel door. Then he stepped out on the gallery, slamming the door behind him with the experience of a convict who had been jailing for a long time. He quickly glanced back into his cell to see whether his bed was wrinkled. It was more a reflex motion than any real concern for the appearance of his cell. Prince fell in step with the man in front of him. How you feel, baby, getting up this morning? The white inmate who locked next to him asked. From the sound of the man's voice, there was no way of telling whether he was black or white. This was not unusual in prison. Many white men, after spending a lot of time behind prison walls, adopted the mannerisms of black men. What's happening, Red? Prince replied easily as they started down the concrete stairs. Glancing down from the third floor gallery, all you could see was a line of blue-dressed men. Break four! came the yell as the brakeman let out the men locking on the fourth gallery. The sound of a hundred steel doors slamming shut came to their ears as they hurried down the stairway. Stop their running down there! A guard yelled from his gun tower. The gun tower was up on the fourth floor, built down from the ceiling, away from the gallery. The only way a man could reach it was from the roof. A prisoner could spend a lifetime behind the walls and never come close to seeing the inside of a gun tower. All he would ever see would be the bright steel of the gun barrel sticking out of one of the many slots. The inmate guilty of running slowed down after he reached a friend he had run to catch up with. They began talking loudly as they continued on towards the line of men lined up on the base, the bottom floor. The sound of so many voices talking together was like a hum of a million bees. The old silent system had been abolished many years before. Now inmates could talk on the way to chow while sitting in the dining hall, even while standing in the line as they went to eat. Jackson Prison, 
the largest penal institution in the United States was becoming modern. The men lined up as the guards waited patiently until the men quieted down before opening the doors and allowing them to file out quietly. Guards walked up and down the line speaking to individual prisoners. What's wrong, Jones? You ain't hungry this morning? You there, Collins, keep the bullshit up. We got all fucking day. If you don't eat, it's your own damn fault. From close association, most of the guards spoke the same language the inmates used. I guess don't none of those boys want to peck today, the sergeant said. He rubbed his huge pot gut and laughed. None of the guards working the floors or blocks or yard were allowed to carry any form of weapon. There were no more nightsticks or guns at the guard's sides. If violence occurred, it was up to the guard to get his ass to cover or under one of the gun towers. The line of men soon quieted down enough to satisfy the guards. They started filing out the large doors of three block. The other eight blocks inside the prison walls had already eaten. Prince walked beside Red, shooting the bull until they reached the mess hall. Then, by tacit agreement, the men split up, blacks going in one side of the huge mess hall, whites in the other side. The men segregated themselves in the mess hall by personal choice, blacks eating on one side, whites on the other. Here and there, you could see a sprinkling of whites sitting with blacks. In most of these instances, it was a white homosexual sitting with his man. Or when it occurred on the white side, a black homosexual sitting with his white man. At times, it would just be friends sitting together, but it was more likely to be lovers together. At all times during the meal, the men were kept under surveillance by the men in the gun towers. At the first sign of any disturbance, long-barreled rifles will appear in the gun slots. It was a known fact amongst the inmates that the guards would shoot and shoot quick. It didn't take much to give them cause for target practice. In prison, a man quickly learned that at the beginning of any fight, you got the hell clear of the fighting area. Because when the guards started to fire, it would be right into the crowd of fighters. Prince ate quickly and left the mess hall. It was yard time now, so he had a few hours until it started to get dark before locking back up. He searched through the gym first, looking for his older friend, Fox. The gym was full of men playing basketball on the two courts, plus men in the weight pits lifting iron over their heads, trying to build muscles so they can impress their girlfriends when they got out. On the benches lining the walls, men sat, huddled over, playing chess and checkers, cigarettes stacked up beside them to bet with. Prince retraced his steps and walked over to Las Vegas, a large area with wooden tables and seats. Here, the men gambled from the beginning of yard time until it ended, winter or summer. In the winter, you could find them huddled up in their winter coats, betting boxes of cigarettes as if they were real money. To them, they were money. In prison, cigarettes take the place of currency. You could buy everything from a homemade knife to a sex act with one of the many queers who lived like beauty queens inside the prison walls. All it took were cigarettes. To have a quick relationship with one of the younger, prettier queers, it would cost two cartons of smokes, any brand. Older homosexuals will sell themselves for five packs on up. The prices varied with the merchandise. Any sissy, no matter how ugly he might be, could find a boyfriend. From 18 up to 80, if they had a hot head or whatever else it took, somebody inside the prison walls would gladly become his man. Fox saw Prince coming and stepped away from the poker game he had been watching. Hey there, guy. I've been looking for you. Yeah, Fox. The bastards fed us last today, Prince said as he walked up to his associate. Fox was in his late 30s with the appearance of a man in his early 50s. 
eyes had deep circles around them, while there was a thinning out of his hair that came with old age. His face was slightly bloated, and his pale brown skin had a burnt look about it, as though it had seen too much scorching sun. He was short, about 5'7", with a growing paunch. His gut hung over his belt buckle. Let's walk around a while. His voice was firm and strong. Prince fell in step with the older man. He had grown accustomed to Fox's way of speaking long ago. He was not necessarily used to people talking to him in his manner, but he had long ago learned to accept certain things if he thought that they would one day pay off in his favor. They walked side by side around the yard. As they passed the stands, Prince waved to Red, who was sitting with some hillbillies playing guitars. God damn, it's more fucking woods with guitars inside this joint than there is roaches in the city, Fox said and removed his hanky to wipe sweat from his brow. The goddamn hot weather brings them out with them funky guitars like flies. Prince laughed and continued to walk without comment. He was used to hearing Fox curse over just about everything inside the prison. Fox had done nine years on a 20-year sentence for a sale of heroin. He will be going up for a special in another month, and with his good record, Prince was hoping that he made it. With the release of Fox, his plans will be falling right in order. He needed that good connect that Fox had with the Dagos. A good heroin connect with Italians would make a young, fast black man rich. Hey Prince, you got a minute? An elderly black man called. Both men stopped and waited for the older man to catch up. I just wanted to find out if you could let me have a couple of packs, Prince. I got some good spud juice lined up, but it takes five packs to cop. I'm sorry, Dad. I done gave away all my extra stuff. Prince answered politely, smiling, and revealing evilly spaced white teeth. The old man shook his head and walked away. I should have remembered you're getting up in the morning, he answered over his shoulder. I just can't understand why you waste your fucking time with them deadbeat sprints, Fox said as he coldly watched the older man walk away. He wasn't always down and out, man. He's just getting old now, and Tom's done passed him by, Prince answered, then added, I remember him from the old neighborhood, Fox. He used to always have time for us kids when he was doing good. He pulled up in that white caddy he drove, and we'd always be able to hit him up for a few dollars. He was a goddamn fool, Fox said harshly. When he caught his case, that nigga had big money. More than the average nigga ever sees in a lifetime. Now look at him. Anytime an old man's a fool enough to leave all his money with a young bitch, he's supposed to get took. That was true enough. Prince agreed silently he had the same thoughts. Not only any old man, but any young one too. Still, it didn't stop him from being kind to the old man. He believed kindness was the sweetest con of all. Ever since he had been here, he had used a pleasant front, picking the men around him so subtly that they never knew he was using them. It had taken him two weeks to pick the little knowledge out of old dad. Now he knew how old dad had gotten rich, which people he had gone to to get the connections he needed to get his whiskey stills made. All of this and more was written down in his cell. He knew just the people to go to for sugar connects, where he could buy 20,000 pounds of sugar without any static. In fact, when his woman had come up to visit him last month, he had had her check it out, and now it was all set up, ready for him to get it out and put the business into operation. He smiled silently as he remembered her last letter. She had mentioned that she had a hundred thousand pounds of sweetness for him whenever he got out. The guards who censored the mail would have never realized that she was talking about sugar stashed away in an empty slum house. 
I don't know how that old bastard made that kind of money he was supposed to have made of a corn whiskey anyway, Fox said as they started to walk again. It ain't that kind of money in no whiskey in this day and age. This is the 60s, not the roaring 20s. You know all bastard you, Prince thought coldly. Just continue thinking that way. Maybe you're right at that, Fox, he said, agreeing with him, as he always did, whenever he knew there was no point in starting a useless argument. There was a crowd in the middle of the yard, so they stopped and watched it for a few moments. Two men stood closely together, while another man stood in front of them with a Bible. There was just another marriage going on. Almost weekly in the large prison, some homosexual was getting married to another man behind the bleak walls of prison. It had become so regular that few people stopped to watch it. God damn punks! Fox cursed loudly, his words carrying to the men in the rear of the crowd. Hey, Prince! One of the men yelled from the crowd. They passing out ice cream and pop as soon as the wedding is over. That's all right, Bull. I got some script. We might stop at the store on the way around and pick up something. Prince replied with humor. Unless you want some of their ice cream, he said to his companion. I rather be dead first, Fox replied with his usual impoliteness. You know me better than that, Prince. That shit is for these goddamn parasites like Bull. Whenever you hear something being given away, you'll damn sure find him in the front of the fucking line. I wish they would give away some shit sandwiches. He'd probably be right there in the front of the line for that motherfucking shit too. Prince glanced down at his companion. Again, he wondered how the man had survived nine years behind the walls without getting himself killed. Fox bitched about anything and everything. If he wasn't crying over the food, he was complaining about the lousy movies that came inside the prison once a week. About that favor I've been asking you about, Fox, you're gonna do that for me. I don't know, Prince. I gave it a lot of thought, man, but it just ain't right. I can't send you to them people like that. Before Prince could interrupt, he continued. You just wait until I get out, baby, and we'll go over to the Big Apple together. Prince remained silent for a minute. It was no more than he had thought would happen. He had never really believed that Fox would give him the connection in New York, but he had kept on trying until his last day in prison. Yeah, man, yeah. I didn't believe you'd act like a true friend, Fox, he said, some of his anger displayed in his voice. After fucking around with me for over three years, Fox, you still don't trust me enough to let me get this thing off the ground for us? By the time you get out, man, I could be done May 50 grand. Hold on there, 50 grand, man. Just hold on. Look at here. When I get to the board, and if I don't make it, I'll write and let you know. Then all you got to do is send your woman up here to see me, and I'll give her the information you need. Sure, baby, sure. Prince answered and turned his back and walked away. If it happened, cool. But if it didn't, he had other irons in the fire. By this time next year, he planned to have the city of Detroit wrapped up. It wasn't a bad dream for a young man of 22. He had come to prison at the tender age of 18. Now, four years later, he was educated with a schooling that a man could get nowhere else but in prison. He had learned the hard way that if you were going to live a life of crime, go for the big buck. Now, he was ready. Chapter 2 The Greyhound bus roared through the outskirts of Detroit. Prince twisted around in his seat and pretended to stare out of the window. He tried to ignore the slim blonde man next to him. They had both been released from the prison at the same time that morning. After reaching the bus station, they had been left alone, but for some reason, the young white man hadn't wanted it that way. He continued to stay close to Prince. When the bus arrived, he had followed Prince to the back of the coach and sat beside him. Prince stretched out his long legs as a bell went off in the back of his mind. No, it couldn't be. 
he told himself, and tried to push the thoughts out of his head. After leaving Queers alone for four years while in prison, it couldn't be possible for one to try to pick him up on his first day out. He went back over their conversation slowly, looking for a hint of the truth. For the first few minutes of the ride, they had talked about the prison. Then they both had started speaking about their futures. After a few minutes of this, Prince attempted to change the conversation back to prison. He had quickly grown tired of talking about choppers. After 20 minutes of being told how to turn some kind of 1957 motorcycle into a chopper, he turned his back on the boy in disgust. Here was a son of a bitch 25 years old, he thought, who believed all you had to do was get a fucking motorcycle and you had it made with all the bitches in the world. This bastard is queer as a $3 bill, Prince told himself coldly as his eyes turned a frosty gray. All this crap about motorcycles is a fake out. He listened to the young man's voice go on and on until he finally decided to put an end to it. Prince turned back around and stared at the young man in the eyes. How would you like to go to a motel when we get in the city? Prince asked sharply. Now that it was out in the open, Prince could see the man's desire. His hesitation was only a fake out. I don't do those kinds of things, the young man replied uneasily. He was nervous and his hands shook slightly as he lit a cigarette. Don't give me that shit. Prince answered harshly, you've been had before. I've been trying to place you ever since we left the joint, and now I got you pegged. You used to be Eddie Townsend's woman in the joint. Don't bullshit me, because it won't do you any good. The young man shook his head. That's not true, he said. You really must have me mixed up with someone else. Bullshit, Prince answered coldly. What did you say your name was? Johnny. Yeah, that's right. They used to call you Johnny May. I remember your little fine ass now. Johnny dropped his head, too frightened or ashamed to speak. He dropped his eyes, afraid to return Prince's stare. Now that Prince had hit on the right track, he continued more ruthless than he needed to be. He wanted to browbeat the kid. So, you know you been had, Johnny boy, ain't you? So why you want to start acting like a man now? You didn't act like one when you was in the joint, did you? He laughed harshly, the sound of his laughter filling the coach. The young man's eyes searched Prince's face with desperation. He muttered brokenly, They made me do it! They made me! I swear to God, they forced me to! Beginning to tire of his little game, Prince said flatly, I knew there wasn't no way for no fine young blonde bitch like you to go behind the walls and come out without being touched up. His words beat at Johnny like a tattoo. I mean, why did you come on with all that motorcycle crap when you sat down here anyway, boy? Was that your way of making me think you're bad or something? Prince shook his head. Well, anyway, boy, you ain't got to worry about me. I don't use, I don't care if you're a punk or not. It don't make me no difference one way or the other. Prince didn't even glance around when Johnny got up and walked to the front of the coach. He bent down and spoke softly to the driver. At the next red light, the driver pulled over. With his small shoebox clutched under his arm, Johnny jumped from the bus. Prince watched him depart, carrying the accumulation of junk that he had collected while in prison. As the bus pulled away, Johnny started to wave, then caught himself and looked away. Prince smiled to himself as he stared at his own reflection in the window. His heavy eyebrows seemed to meet as he scowled at the passing scenery. In a few minutes, the bus was parking in the terminal. Prince grabbed up his few belongings and pushed his way to the front. One woman complained loudly as he pushed his way between her and her children. He glanced back over his shoulder and caught her with an icicle glare. For years, he had waited and thought of the day when he would return home.
in none of his wildest dreams, he had imagined being cursed out by some woman on his first day out. For a brief moment, some of the ruthlessness he kept concealed beneath a front of good humor revealed itself. The woman glanced away from him quickly and busied herself with her four children. As she bent down to straighten out one of the kids' jackets, Prince got a glimpse of a full black bosom and his anger left. It had been years since he had seen anything close to a woman's breasts, and the sight was rewarding enough to restore his anticipation. He continued on his way, elbowing a fat salesman out of his path as he hurried down the steps of the bus. Once free from the pushing of the crowd of departing passengers, Prince stopped and allowed himself to breathe deeply, enjoying the taste of freedom. He stared around as if it were his first time in a big city. Any passerby would have taken him for a country boy on his first trip to a large city. His face lit up with a broad smile as he stared around at the milling crowd of people. His happiness was easy to see. Suddenly, he spotted a group of teenagers standing off to the side. People seemed to be giving them a lot of room. He waved and started to make his way in their direction. The leader of the group was standing out in front of them, posing and scrutinizing the passengers with as much disgust in his stare as he could possibly manage. A look of recognition appeared in Roman's eyes as he noticed Prince break through the crowd. Over here, baby! He yelled loudly. The gang rushed forward to meet Prince. They crowded around him, banging him on his back roughly. Prince shook the hands of the boys and girls surrounding him, then stepped over to where Roman stood, all alone, watching the group of teenagers. As Prince held his hand out towards Roman, his mind went back into the past. It had been over four years since they had parted company. On that occasion, they had been locked up in the bullpen and the city jail. Each man sunk deep in his own thoughts. Both of them were aware that neither one of them would likely get out for a long time. They had been caught red-handed with a car of stolen television sets. Glad to see you, Prince. Roman said softly, his black eyes flashing with concealed amusement. Just under six feet, with slim, boyish shoulders, what caught the attention immediately was his keen features. His sharp nose was set off by the constant sneer on his tightly clenched lips. In height, Prince towered over him. As the two men stared at each other, Prince held his hawk-like eyes on Roman until the smaller man dropped his eyes. Did you take care of everything like I told you to, Roman? He asked quietly. Everything's been taken care of, Prince. We've just been waiting for you to get out so we can really stretch out. Prince smiled slightly. Neither man spoke further until they left the station and entered the parking lot. One of the girls screamed sharply, then began to curse loudly. God damn it, Joan! Can't you act like a young fucking lady instead of some fucking whore who happens to be out for the night? Roman yelled over his shoulder at the cursing woman. You bitches can't go nowhere without cussing like goddamn fools. Prince, she called. This son of a bitch here should be locked up in a goddamn cage somewhere. She pointed her finger at one of the members of the gang who was bringing up the rear. Brute, the man she pointed out, grinned broadly. Her ass is softer than cotton candy, he said loudly to the amusement of his friends. She stopped and pulled her sweater up, then removed a large knife from her bra. With a well-practiced swift motion, she pointed it towards Brute. You put your fucking hands under my dress again, Brute, and I'll cut some of the fat off your lard ass. Don't tell me a friendly little feel gonna cost Brute some of his ass, one of the other members remarked as they joked back and forth. 
Joan, a tall, underweight, light brown-skinned woman, kept up a steady flow of curse words until they reached the cars. She was pretending to be more angry than she actually was. Most of the men in the gang had had her at one time or another. What she really hoped to do was impress Prince. Knowing that he had just come home from prison, she hoped that he would end up spending the night with her. It would really be a feather in her cap if she could bed down with the big man. In her daydreams, she could see herself as his number one girl. She stared at his broad back as they stood beside the cars. She preferred tall black men, and Prince fit the bill perfectly. To her, he was the most handsome man she had ever seen. Roman opened the door to a beat-up 62 Ford. We ain't got but the two cars, baby, but I know things are going to change now that you're back home. He nodded towards the older car parked beside the Ford. Joan forced her way into the car with Roman and Prince, pushing ahead of the two other girls who were trying to get in with them. The rest of you bras get in the other car, Roman ordered, after three girls climb into the back seat. Everyone wanted to be close to Prince, the women most of all. Damn, baby, Roman exclaimed. It seems as if all the bitches got hot pants for you, Prince. When your old lady gets out, she gonna have big fun kicking these backstabbing bitches in the ass. Yeah, man. They ain't never had no cherry before, and they think this is a cherry they'll be getting, Prince replied and laughed. He tossed his arm over the front car seat. Roman, sitting between Prince and the driver, moved slightly to avoid his arm. I should have put one of the broads up front, he said. Shortman, a muscular, narrow-faced man, drove expertly, taking most of the side streets to avoid the downtown traffic. He turned on Michigan Avenue and followed it on out until he reached the slums. It was swarming with Mexicans, Italians, and other foreigners. Short man slowed down in the worst part of the slum quarters and parked in front of the roost. The Roost was the main clubhouse of the rulers, the best organized and most vicious young gang of teenagers Detroit had ever encountered. After convicting Prince and sending him to the state penitentiary, the police department's vice squad had made the blunder of thinking they had broken up his highly organized gang. After months of crime, the rumors began to come in that Prince was still running the organization, even though it was from behind prison walls. Prince, waving right and left, led the way down the cellar steps into the roost. Music blasted out of the open door. The couches along the walls were occupied by young couples locked in each other's arms. At the end of the room, ten young men wearing identical outfits were sitting on soft stools besides a long bar watching a girl swinging her hips along with the beat of the music. One of the men at the bar spotted Prince weaving through the crowd. He rose, walked over to the wall, and hit the light switch, flooding the room with light. A low mutter of discontent welled up only to die down as Prince put his hands on his hips. If there's anybody in here that's not a gang leader, he said loudly, step outside until after this meeting is over. Some of the fellows sitting by the wall began to leave, followed by their girls. Two of the men sitting at the bar stood up. Prince waved them down. All the members of the rulers stay, he ordered. He waited until the door closed behind the last lagging person. Okay, he began, looking out over the still crowded room. Now we can get down to business. I guess all of you already know just about what I'm going to say, but you're not really hep to what the rewards are going to be. I hope by the end of this week, each of you will have your own private car for business and pleasure alike. From here on, nobody makes a move without the okay of their district leader. He stopped speaking to make sure everyone was paying attention. Before you guys were fighting over such small things as what turfs or blocks each gang ruled, that kid shit is out. His voice carried the conviction that he wouldn't accept any interference. 
in case any of you studs out there with 20 or 30 punks in your gang should ever happen to think you're a little too strong to have to take orders, look around you. Slowly, Prince lit a cigarette. Each man and woman here has at least 10 followers in his gang. For those of you who can't count too goddamn good, there's at least 60 people here. Not counting the broads so that we will be about 600 studs. Are there any comments? Yeah, a tall red-headed boy said. If we can't make a score when we want to, man, how in the hell are we going to make our pocket money? Don't worry, Prince replied. After today, all of y'all are on my payroll. Each gang leader will receive $50 for every 10 members in his or her club. Say, man, one of the guys yelled from the back suspiciously. Just what the hell are we going to have to do for this kind of money? Don't worry. Prince assured him, you won't have to do no more than what you've been doing. The only difference is that this time, you'll be organized. Well, Prince, what about us? One of the girls asked. The same goes for the women. You won't be called on to do much more than you're already doing. Just what do you mean, a slim girl standing on the side asked, by too much more? From here on out, Prince answered abruptly. Any one of you girls become strung out on drugs. We'll find a whorehouse for you to work out of before some pimp gets his hands on you. Also, whenever you find one of the Debs in your gang is screwing everybody and everything, that's whorehouse material. And the organization wants to know about it. He stared coldly at the women until they looked away. Now, Prince said softly, there's one more thing you had better know. From here on out, whenever you see someone wearing one of these outfits, he turned and pointed at the outfits his gang members wore. You can spread the word that there is going to be a hit made somewhere in this city. Other than that, he added significantly, you'll never see them wear anything but silks or sport clothes. He waited until he was sure they understood what he meant, then continued, we're going to start an organization that almost every one of us in this room will sooner or later take part in. All of you. All of you are aware of this rising cry of the 60s. Black is beautiful. Black is beautiful. I'm black and I'm proud. Well, we're going to jump on the grandstand with all the rest of the organizations that use this as their rallying cry. Before the month is out, we'll be backing a group of our own called FNLM. Those letters will mean Freedom Now liberation movement behind that organization will be able to manipulate a whole lot of squares that ordinarily wouldn't go along with our program prince removed the handkerchief and wiped the sweat from his brow there's no reason now for me to explain to you why we need this front or what we're going to do with it all you need to know is that one day We'll be behind it. He dropped his cigarette on the floor and stepped on it. I haven't run down everything yet, but whatever else I've got to say to you, I'll get in touch with you over the phone. Sometime tomorrow, the person who will be giving you your orders will stop by each of your clubhouses and you can get your questions answered completely. Turning his back on the crowd, Prince said warily, I want all the members of the rulers to meet me at my apartment within the next hour. He turned abruptly and started through the crowd, followed by some of his more intimate friends. Behind him, a murmur of subdued voices whispered back and forth. It was as though a giant had just left their presence. Chapter 3 Prince stopped on the sidewalk, 
inhaled the fresh evening air, and let his eyes rove over a couple of the young mini-skirted girls as they passed by. They flirted with him boldly, switching their firm hips. Prince continued to watch them as they walked down the street. He hoped the short skirts would stay in style for another two or three years. I'll be damn glad when Ruby gets out, Prince said sharply. The sight of the girls had aroused his desire more than he wanted to admit. They gave her ten days last week for driving without a goddamn license, short man replied quickly, not aware that it was about the hundredth time someone had told Prince the same thing that day. She should get out Friday, Prince, if she don't go and fuck up some kind of way, Roman added as he came up behind them. Prince turned and glanced over his shoulder. Most of the members of the rulers had come out of the club to form a crowd behind him. Well, let's get over to my place before we end up getting picked up for loitering, Prince said and laughed pleasantly. Before the words were out of his mouth, young men and women began to pile into the cars up and down the street. The elite of the gang scampered for seats in the car with Prince and Roman. Brute. Fat Daddy and Ape Man used a flying wedge to monopolize the back seat. Danny, a vicious-natured young man in his early 20s, got in under the steering wheel. Prince squeezed in the front seat between Roman and the driver, then twisted around. What's been happening, Ape Man? You look like you're trying to catch up with Fat Daddy in pounds, Prince said and grinned at the dark-skinned, hairy-armed man. Ape Man, huge and brutal, grinned back. On his wide face, the grin looked like a sneer, but it wasn't. He had been dedicated to Prince ever since grade school. There was a bond between them that Ape Man held dear. Among the three large men in the back seat of the car, there was a constant challenge over which was the roughest. Fat Daddy might have exceeded the other two men by a few pounds, but when it came to viciousness, they were equal. As the car moved away from the curb, Prince settled back in his seat and fell silent, thinking over things that Roman had said to him earlier. He had spent four years planning, so Roman's objections were nothing new to him. Prince spoke his thoughts out loud. I didn't just start thinking about this thing, Roman. I've been kicking your objections around, man, and I can see where you're coming from. I know when things get rough, somebody is going to talk. But by the time we get finished with whoever does talk, it will be quite a while before somebody else tries to snitch on us again. Danny gave a sharp bark that went for a laugh. Yeah, baby, if there's one thing a nigga fears, it's the thought of someone sticking a blade between his shoulder blades. His harsh laughter sounded again. To people who did not know him, it would have been a chilling sound. But to these men who lived beside him, he was just being himself. They all knew that he was a dangerous man, but they considered themselves just as dangerous, if not more so. Roman laughed. What are you going to use to enforce this fear, Prince? He asked sardonically. The fearsome three sitting in the back seat? Brute spoke up. I don't see what's so goddamn funny about that, Roman. You ain't the big wheel in the show no more, so be cool. Prince might give us the go-ahead, and you'll see just how efficient we can be. Sweet Jesus, Danny exclaimed. I wouldn't mind helping out the fearsome three if that's the case. Roman frowned at Danny. You better keep your lip buttoned, punk, he said, or you might find yourself unable to close it. With a casual gesture, Danny removed a straight razor from his pocket. The only reason I followed you up to now, Roman, he said, is because I've had my orders from Prince. Other than that, boy, I'd have stuck my razor in your ass a long time ago. The roar of laughter from the back seat caused Prince to intervene. Okay, killer, he said coldly. All of you will get a chance to show your best hands before it's over. So be cool. The group in the car fell silent. Prince reflected on his closest men as the silence held. Roman was a good man, smart, 
but he lacked the ruthlessness it took to rule such a gang. When they had been in the city jail waiting to go before the judge, it was Roman who had come up with the idea of flipping the coin to see who would take the weight. Prince lost, so he pleaded guilty, stating that Roman had accepted a lift not knowing that the stuff in the back seat of the car was stolen. It had been doubtful whether or not the judge believed him, but they realized that if Prince stuck with his testimony, it would have been impossible to convict Roman, so they released him. What's this black power bit, baby? Danny asked suddenly. You know, as well as I do, Prince replied. With all this black awareness coming to light, we're going to ride to the top of the hill on it. Once we get organized, we'll be able to function smoother and faster. I was in the joint when all that burning and looting jumped off in 67, but I'm here now. With the organization we're fixing to start, we'll be able to sway the people, start fights against the man. Keep pounding it into the people's faces about police brutality, which there's plenty of, always plenty of. All we got to do is keep it before the people's faces, and every time the pigs do something to a black man that stinks, we'll be on the case and cash in on it. Danny hesitated briefly, then said, I don't like the idea of fronting our people off, Prince. They catch too much hell already without us sticking a dick to them. We ain't gonna front them off, baby, Prince replied quickly. If anything, we'll be showing them the way. Today is the year of the black man's revolution. Whenever a revolution jumps off, somebody gains. So why not us during this particular one? Daddy pulled up and parked in front of a row of apartments that resembled modern motel cabins. This joint here, Roman began, is the best. Knock it off, Prince interrupted. I don't want no excuses. If this is the pad you caught for me, it's too late for you to start trying to clean up. You should have thought about it and handled it before I came home. They entered the dinky apartment single file. Prince glanced around at the cheap furniture. The end tables were burned from cigarettes left carelessly around. Roman, Prince said softly, do you think all the members can fit into this death trap? Roman laughed self-consciously. Yeah, man, they can all get in here. I would have gotten something bigger, but I just didn't have that kind of bread. Cars began to pull up in front of the house, and the first group to arrive called back and forth to friends and other cars. The few girls mixed in the arriving crowd squealed loudly as they came in the door. Brute, standing beside the door, was giving everyone in the skirt a pinch on the rear. The room quickly filled with whispering, laughing teenagers. Prince slowly raised his hand for silence. Immediately, the room became as quiet as a tomb. Roman, watching, fought back his anger. After being the leader of this gang for over four years, he still couldn't command that kind of respect. Prince pulled up a chair and propped his foot on it. All right, let's get down to business. I've already split up the districts that each of you will collect from. If any of you should run into trouble trying to collect any money, contact Roman, Danny, or Chinaman. Collect the money from who? Shortman asked, dumbfounded. Prince glanced around the room, noticing the puzzlement on the faces staring at him. Each of you will collect your money from the people that attended the meeting tonight at the club. They, in turn, will collect theirs from all the business places in their districts. That sounds like the old extortion bit, Prince. Ain't that just about been worn out? One of the members asked. Yeah, it's been used time and time again, but not the way we are going to do it. There ain't enough pigs on the police force to handle all the trouble we're going to send their way. Sometime tomorrow, Brute, Ape Man, Fat Daddy, and a few more of you will pay a surprise visit to most of the businesses, places in the inner city. It don't make no difference if it's owned by a black or white. They all get the same treatment. 
Prince pulled a cigarette from his pack and tossed the empty package on the floor. After you begin tearing the place up, he continued, I'll send a gang from the neighborhood around to stop you. Now, if the storekeepers don't get the message, we'll just put his or her John Henry in our little black book and we pay our next visit, they'll never forget it because we'll be playing for keeps. Damn, Prince, one of the members said. They'll have so many policemen there. When we go back, you won't be able to see past the goddamn uniforms. Don't worry about the cops, Prince replied. They won't be able to stay there forever. And we got all the time in the world to wait. I got one of the best young lawyers in the country. So we won't have to worry about any bullshit arrests. As long as we got plenty money on hand, Bond won't be any problem. In case someone should take a fall, though, they won't have any worries. We'll take care of their people for them as long as they're away. Plus, put up a large nest egg for them so when they get out, they'll have some nice money waiting. Prince waited until he thought his words had sunk in before continuing. Our largest income will come from dope and corn whiskey. I've already picked out which of you will be my collectors on the drugs being sold in this city. After tomorrow, not a drop of horse, dexies, or reefer will be sold in this town without us getting some part of that money. All the dealers will have to pay protection to operate. Again, he waited to see the effect of his words. I know a lot of you don't know anything about corn whiskey, he said as he removed a small notebook from his pack pocket. But it's big business. He flipped open the page. Last year alone, in Detroit, there was over $5 million made off of homemade whiskey. It was a staggering sum to most of the young people in the room. They whispered back and forth until Prince interrupted. That's right. Five million and here in this city, it's a black man's racket. Now, what we're going to do is monopolize the whiskey business. In three months, if we can get big enough, not a drop of whiskey will be sold unless we make it. Roman stepped up beside Prince, a small notebook in his hand. So far, we got eight whiskey stills ready to be put up, plus all the corn and sugar we'll need. He ran his finger down the page. We got six houses rented, with the stills inside the house waiting for operators. As far as customers go, we got 50 customers who'll take from 20 gallons down to 5 gallons from us at a time. Prince nodded his head, pleased. Homemade whiskey brings $10 a gallon. Or if the customer buys over 20 gallons at a time, we'll let it go for $8 a gallon. Prince read from his notebook. Short man will be in charge of the operation. He will have four of you as his lieutenants. Each of you will have a district. Your jobs will be to see that the members of whatever gangs are assigned to you produce enough whiskey to keep your side of the city up until we can get more stills in operation. Prince stopped and flipped the page. Each still should be able to produce at least 30 gallons of whiskey a day. In seven days, your quota will be no less than 210 gallons. At $10 a jug, you can add it up yourself and see how much money we'll be making. Prince's plan had left the people in the apartment stunned. At first, his ideas had been unbelievable to most of them. But the longer he talked, the more the magnetism of his personality won them over. Tess, Prince said, speaking to a tall brown-skinned girl wearing a high natural. I want you to take absolute control of all the Debs until Ruby is released. Your main job will be to see that most of the girls take at least two tricks a night someplace where the boys can roll them without too much trouble. Danny will be working right beside you, so you won't have too much to worry about. 
The main thing is that as soon as your girls lead a trick off, you make damn sure that girl gets the hell out of that neighborhood. That, Danny said, don't seem like too much of a job to me, just taking off some drunk, chasing his heart around. Prince laughed harshly. Don't worry, he said. There's more to it than that. We're going to need as many stolen cars as we can get for various jobs. Sometimes, when we have a large job on hand, you'll have to detain some poor truck while the boys borrow his papers to go along with his car. Danny laughed. His admiration for Prince was obvious. Yeah, man, I can dig it now. Just keep the trick under wraps until after the sting goes off. That's right, baby, Prince replied. You got the picture now. Whatever men you might need, just let me or Roman know, and you can have them. Prince glanced around at all the astonished faces. The magnitude of his plans had jolted them out of their fantasies of toughness. I didn't bother telling you, Prince said, his voice harsh, but it goes without saying. There's no such thing as quitting. You're all in it till the bitter motherfucking end. If it should happen to go that way. Preacher, a tall brown-skinned Negro wearing a midnight black silk suit, stood up. He casually displayed the exquisite jewelry on his wrist with a swift motion of his left arm. Prince, he began, I'm having a little trouble down in the Hastings projects. Oh, and how is that? Prince asked. Well, to begin with, Preacher said, everybody here is hip to the stud I'm having trouble with. This stud thinks he's a little too big for the things you're trying to work out of, Prince. He also told me to tell you not to come down to the projects with that shit of yours, because he don't want to hear it. Prince studied Preacher coldly. How many guys does he have following him now? I'd say he got at least a hundred, if not more. If something happened to Dave, Preacher, who will fill his shoes? Prince asked softly. That's easy, Preacher replied. You're looking at him right now. Can I depend on that? Prince asked softly. You can damn well depend on it, Prince. Once Dave is out of the way, I'll be the big dog down there. The meaning of the conversation was not missed by anyone in the room. Everybody knew that Square Dave was big not only in his own neighborhood, but anywhere in the city he chose to go. A young girl with hair bleached bright blonde yelled, Say, Prince, when are we going to start celebrating your homecoming? Soon, honey. Soon. But first, we're going to take care of the business at hand, Prince said sharply. So first of all, I want all of you to put your ruler outfits on. And then I want you to make sure you're seen all over the city. That means there's going to be trouble in the city, don't it, Prince? Shortman asked. You hit the nail on the head, baby boy. That's just what the fucking means, Prince replied. Make sure all of you have an airtight alibi. Stay in the lights wherever you've taken a notion to be. Make sure you're seen, but make sure you can prove where you were at, too. Chapter 4 in a penthouse across town in the heart of the city, two identical blondes dressed in skin-tight black satin dresses swayed to the beat of soft jazz. A door opened from one of the bedrooms and a young man stepped into the wall-to-wall -wall carpeted living room. Jesus Christ, he exclaimed. Don't tell me you two are still doing that funky dance. He stared at the two women in disgust. Can we help it that we'd like to dance? One of the blondes replied. Tony, the other woman called, shaking her hips meaningfully. Come dance with me. 
Tony ran his hand through his wavy jet black hair and stared at the women who had spoken to him. Why don't you go in the bedroom and wake Racehorse up if you want somebody to dance with you, he said without anger. Donna better not wake up, my old man, the first blonde said loudly. She stared at her sister, daring her to go into the bedroom. A silence settled on the room as the sisters stared at each other. They had both come a long way from that small town in Upper Michigan. Yet, they stuck together, neither one trusting the other, but true to each other in their own way. Don't worry, Donna answered, running her hands through Tony's hair. I got me a pretty little wop to play with. You keep running your mouth, Tony said roughly, and I'm gonna slap some of the goddamn lipstick off of you. He turned to the other woman. Rhonda, why don't you go wake up your old man and find out whether he wants to go out for dinner or stay cooped up in this goddamn joint. Shit, Tony, Rhonda replied in a frightened voice. You know how mad my old man is when I wake him up. Why don't you try waking him up? Gee whiz, Rhonda, Donna yelled. You act like you can't even talk to your man without him jumping all over you. Rhonda drew a long breath, letting it out slowly. I don't care what you say. I'm not about to go into that bedroom and wake Racehorse up. If you want to find out where he wants to eat, go ask him. But don't expect me to do it. Donna laughed sharply. I sure wouldn't let any man have me that frightened of him. Watch your mouth, Tony warned. He pushed her hand away from his hair. Well, I mean it, she continued. If any man had me that afraid, I sure do something about it. Like what? He asked, suddenly interested. Not heeding the warning glitter in his eyes, Donna continued. Well, for one thing, I wouldn't let no man whip me the way he beats her up. I don't care if I had to wait until he went to sleep. I'd fix his wagon. Before the words were out of her mouth, Tony had slapped her viciously across the face. Why do I always have to warn you about running off at the mouth woman? Donna, holding the side of her face, screamed at him. What the hell did you go and do that for, you son of a bitch and bastard? Tony swung and knocked her down with one blow, then removed his belt and began to beat her. She squirmed on the floor, screaming in pain. Please, baby, please! I didn't mean no harm! Rhonda, screaming, ran into the bedroom for a racehorse. A harsh, masculine voice responded, Bitch, if you don't get the fuck out of here with all of that goddamn noise, I'll get up from this bed and kick a mud hole in your ass. Rhonda left the bedroom door open as she turned and fled back to the safety of the living room. In panic, she jumped on Tony's back in an attempt to save her sister from the brutal beating. Without even a struggle, Tony pulled her from his back and pushed her onto the floor beside Donna. His face was twisted into a snarl as he swung the belt down on the two screaming women. The shrieking of both women filled the apartment. The commotion finally produced what Rhonda was hoping for. Racehorse appeared in the doorway. He stared at the spectacle before him. There was a look of exasperation on his ebony face. He looked as out of place as a housewife at a stag party as he stood in the doorway in a velvet black robe. Around his head was the bright yellow scarf he wore when he slept to keep his processed hair in place. After observing the scene quietly for a few moments, he spoke up. What the hell are you planning on doing, Tony? Beat them until the police come up and pull you off of them? He stared at the two women squirming on the floor, their skirts above their hips, red welts on their thighs from Tony's belt. Tony was too absorbed in the beating to lay off immediately. With difficulty, he gained control of himself and stopped. If you can't get along with them fucking whores, Tony, why don't you just put their fucking asses out? Racehorse asked coldly. His eyes were bleak as he stared from one woman to the other. I didn't do nothing, Daddy, Rondi yelled as she scrambled up from the floor. 
Please, honey, it wasn't my fault, she pleaded. I was just trying to stop him from beating up my sister. He looked as though he was trying to kill her, Daddy. Racehorse stared at her. All you white whores are crazy, he said harshly. You should know better than to interfere with their fights. Whatever they do, they don't have a damn thing to do with you. You understand that, bitch? It won't happen again, Daddy, I promise, she cried, nodding her head vigorously. Her bright red lipstick was smeared, and there was a dark mark over her right cheekbone. Her blonde hair fell down around her shoulders as she tossed her head back and stared up into Racehorse's face. Racehorse gave her a slight shake. You better make sure it doesn't, because if it does, I'm putting your ass out. Tony gave Donna a kick before he turned and spoke to the tall Negro. I'm sorry, Race, about beating your woman, but the bitch put her ass in where she didn't belong. Race shrugged. The bitch was wrong, so she got what she was looking for. The phone began to ring, and Racehorse walked into the bedroom. In a moment, he reappeared in the doorway with the phone in his hand. Tony, he said. Come in here for a second, will ya? Tony followed him into the bedroom, closing the door silently. Don't worry, Racehorse spoke softly into the receiver. We'll take care of everything. He hung up the receiver and walked over to the dresser, pulling out the bottom drawer. After removing some shirts, he pulled out two snub-nosed 38 automatics. Racehorse examined the pistols carefully before speaking. That was Prince Tony. He's got a little job for us to do down in the projects on Hastings. Damn, Tony said lightly. He didn't waste any time, did he? That's right, baby. I figured he would get home sometime this week, but I sure didn't think we'd be going into action this fast. Laying the guns on the dresser, Racehorse walked over to the closet. We got to take an hour to get to Wilkins and Hastings. By then, a hot car will be sitting there waiting for us. I told Prince that we didn't want to drive a Tony. I figured that you and I could handle it better by ourselves. I dig that, Tony answered. The less people know about it, the better off we are. Racehorse took his time dressing, putting on a black suit. He stuck both pistols inside his belt and stopped in front of a floor-length mirror to make sure the guns didn't bulge. His dark brown eyes were unreadable as he studied himself closely. Sharp, hawk-like features stared back at him from a cold, black face. You about ready, Tony? he asked, his voice trembling slightly with excitement over the coming job. Yeah, Race, I'm just about ready. I got to pick up my hardware from my room. Then we could pull up. Forty-five minutes later, a black coupe pulled up in front of a crowded tenement. A tall black negro leaned out of the car window and spoke to one of the kids playing on the steps. What the hell do you want with Square Dave? A cocoa brown skinned girl asked from the top of the steps. She was about 13 years old. The young Italian driver spoke quietly to the sharp-faced negro next to him. Before the Negro could answer, a tall, husky, pleasant-faced black man came out of the apartment building. The girl at the top of the steps nodded towards the car. Them guys want to see you, Dave, she said in a small voice. Dave stopped for a moment and started on down the steps. The motor of the black coupe leaped to life. People walking up and down the trash-littered streets stopped in their tracks and looked around. From dilapidated ruins that still passed for houses, people peered out, smelling trouble with the built-in instinct of the oppressed. A warning flashed to his mind, and Dave hesitated. Flames of death streaked from the car window as shot after shot after shot found his mark. As Dave staggered the rest of the way down the steps, the coupe roared away from the curb, leaving behind the beginning of murder and the promise of terror. A clamoring crowd gathered around the dying man as two young hoodlums, dressed alike, pushed their way out of the crowd. The sounds of the distant sirens grew stronger as the street lamp's glare fell across the sinister-looking R's on the backs of the men's jackets.
We have reached the finish of this part of the Donald Goins miniseries on Ralph Reed's. I would like to personally thank you, queens and kings, fellow royalty, for stopping by. You may catch up to me on Twitter, Instagram, as well as Periscope at RGMC2407. Send me an email, RGMC2407 at gmail.com, where you may leave a small donation, if you wish, on the Zelle app, or paypal.me forward slash RGMC2407, or the Cash app. My cash tag is RGMC2407. You may also visit me on my very own channel, RGMC, Ralph Garcia, Master of Ceremonies, as well as right here, at home, on the United Ronin Networks. We are Ronin. Fellow royalty, pick up a good book, read a good story, and set your good self free. I appreciate you, and I love you like cooked food. I will see you folks on the next edition of Ralph Reed's Malaykum Asalaam.